Hey, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. I'm back. It has been a long time, hasn't it? For um, those of you who have been listening for a while, you know that I took a break. I hit the pause button, and now I am so happy to be back and creating things for you. It feels so good to be back. So my niece's health is improving, Julie, my niece, Julie, who's been very sick with cancer. And just today, I got the amazing news that her older sister is pregnant. And I am so excited by this. She and her husband have been talking about having a baby and now they're having a baby. So amazing news there. It's been an incredible couple of months, couple of weeks. I'm just so grateful for all of that. As I'm recording this episode, I am still in the United States. I'm in California to be specific, and I am determined to make the most of being here. And I've been thinking about living with uncertainty. I think um, this trip has just been a an opportunity to to play with that a little bit um, with the all the all the uncertainty with my niece's health and uh, with all the things that have been happening in this trip. For example, most recently, my flight has been canceled three times. All in all, my return home has been pushed back by 24 days and my fingers are crossed that it doesn't get pushed back even further. It's happened in increments, so I have been ready to go home three separate times, just so excited to see my husband, so excited to see my dogs, bags packed, everything. And then I get this email that once again, the flight has been canceled and they'll let me know when they have a new one. So as it stands now, my flight, again, fingers crossed, toes crossed, is going to leave in two weeks. So yeah, it has been uh, quite the roller coaster. Um, And I'm going to be honest, I was not at all happy, not a happy camper. Like the first time that the flight got canceled, I was just sort of like, wow, okay, well, now I get a little extra time with my family. So that's cool. And then the second time (laughs) it got canceled, I was like, okay, this is enough. And then the third time I was just like, you have got to be kidding me. Um, And I had a lot of thoughts about how unfair that was, what an imposition it was, um, not once, not twice, but three times making plans, rescheduling, making plans, rescheduling, returning rental cars, finding a new one, all of those fun and exciting things. And I was pretty upset about it. I felt upset. I felt disappointed. I felt sad, frustrated, all the feelings. And I let myself feel them all. I sort of like had this this pity party with myself. I even invited my husband. We commiserated. I realized, of course, that I can't change the situation, but I could decide what I would make it mean and how I was going to respond to it. And so that's when I sort of decided that I was going to make this the best thing that has ever happened. I was going to make it the thing that pushes Savvy Painter forward, that makes my relationship with my husband stronger, all the things that I like to focus on. I just made the decision that these little hiccups would be the the tipping point, I guess, the thing that that brings us forward in the journey. I like to kind of think of it like I love, love, love the show, uh, How I Met Your Mother. And so I told my husband, I'm like, you know, this is sort of like, this is going to be for us, this is going to be how I created the best marriage ever. And 10 years from now, we're going to look back on this as, oh, yeah, remember that episode when I went to the United States and I couldn't come back home for two months? That's the episode that we're in right now, which made us both laugh and made it just kind of turned the whole thing around. So I wanted to tell you that story because I feel like it's a really good segue into what I wanted to talk with you about today. I have been having a lot of conversations 
with my students in growth studio about doing hard things and what that and what we make that mean um, and how we oftentimes will take something that is difficult and then we like throw gasoline on it and we make it even harder. So I'm going to go through a couple examples of that and I'm going to bring it back to your painting and offer you some ideas of how to look at things that I hope you will be able to use in your studio and we'll get you thinking a little bit uh, differently maybe about your practice. So um, I am for sure of the op opinion that what we create, what happens on our canvas, it's a direct reflection of what's happening in our mind. It's also sort of like this saying that I just keep seeing the truth in over and over and over again, which is how we do one thing is how we do everything. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And I've been thinking a lot about the ways that we get in our own way and the way that we make a difficult situation even more difficult with the way that we're thinking about it. As an example, that the situation that with my trip that I was just telling you about, I could easily, and I did slip into this for like a day or two, I was really upset because <laughs> I really, really thought that I was going to see my husband and my dogs on Monday. And I was so ready for that. So I spent a couple days just like upset and, and angry and frustrated and all of those things, right? I could have decided to um, stay there in that frustration and anger and just keep pouring gasoline onto it and just looking for all, allowing my brain to look for and discover all the reasons why this was completely unfair, that it shouldn't be happening, that uh, another cancellation was just quote unquote too much. And had I done that, I could be in the most beautiful place in the world I could make myself completely miserable because of this thought that I shouldn't be here. I should be home by now because I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be home with my family. If that's where my focus, my attention, if that's where my thoughts are, then I'm fighting against reality. As Byron Katie says, when I insist that things shouldn't be how they are. And I think there's a, a distinction that we can make between allowing these feelings of sadness, of disappointment, of frustration, and processing them versus staying there and kind of indulging in them. And by indulging, I mean just kind of like repeating that same thought, sort of this infinite loop, and it doesn't get me anywhere. That's what I would consider an indulgent thought. There's no upside to it. There's nothing that comes out of it. So I can allow these feelings of sadness, frustration, disappointment, all of the things that you might feel when uh, you think something should happen, whatever it is. I'm using myself as an example because it's something that I just processed and went through. But if, you're, if you allow yourself those feelings and then let them pass, they just go straight through. But if I tack on resistance to it, if I continue with the thought that I shouldn't be here, that this shouldn't be happening, that it's not fair, like all of those things. And when I make it mean something has gone wrong because I am still here and I should not be here, I pile more and more onto what I'm just going to call the shit sandwich that I was just served. I just add more onto it. Let's just make that taste even better by just adding more and more onto it. So my flight was canceled. That sucks. Let me just process that. Now what? Now I get to decide how I'm going to handle that. Now I'm going to decide what I make that mean. And now I can choose what I want to do with that circumstance. So here, that's like kind of like the idea in, um, in a context that, that maybe is like really easy to, to understand because I think that a lot of people would agree with me that, yeah, that sucks. Your flight got canceled three times. Most people get upset when there's a delay of, of an hour or two hours or three hours, 24 hours. Oh my God, we're talking 24 days. I'm sure I could find a lot of people who would agree with me that this is terrible and I should be upset. But is that helpful? Does that serve me? So let's take a look at that, that kind of concept and, and apply it to painting. 
let's take the example of something that's hard and how we uh, we as human beings like to make it even harder. So if you look at painting, for example, all of our favorite subjects, we learn a lot of skills. And with each skill that we learn, we get better and better and better at painting. But there are a ton of things that we as painters, we as artists need to learn in order to progress, in order to work towards mastery of our skill. Just painters. We need to learn drawing. We need to learn about line. We need to learn about color, edges, values, proportion, composition, designs, harmony, all these things, right? These are these are the skills that we need. And then on top of that, we also need to learn about our materials. We need to know about what brushes to use, what brushes will make the mark that we need, the paint load, how that affects our painting. We need to uh, think about pressure, like how hard do you push? How light do you push? All the materials, texture, um, all these things we are, these are all sort of skills that we have to learn. So when you think about that, just making a single mark, there's a lot of information in there, right? Because it's where do you hold the brush? What kind of brush? What's the what what kind of bristles? Are they hard? Are they stiff? How 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 much paint are you putting in there? How how much paint is underneath it? How are you are you laying it on top? Are you smushing it in? Are you creating texture? Do you want something smooth? Those are all the questions that we're kind of answering in our head as we make a mark. Is it in the right place? Will this create the shape that I want? Is it uh, is that going to look like a person's arm, or is that going to evoke the feeling that I want? Right. That's a lot of things that we're thinking about with a single brushstroke. Brushstroke. <laughs> right? So painting is hard. It's supposed to be hard. And when we resist that, when we fight against that, when we think it should not be hard, that it should come easy, what happens? We get frustrated. We get frustrated with our painting. We start to think it's our fault. We start to think there's something wrong with us. We start to think that we're not good enough, that we shouldn't be called an artist, that uh, we're not good enough to make it. That, And then when you start thinking all of those thoughts as you're trying to paint, your brain then starts to find all the reasons why that's true. Your brain's like, oh, okay, you're giving me a problem. Let me find all the way, let me find the answers. Let me just go find all the evidence as to why you are not a good painter. You bit off more than you could chew. You should not have decided to paint this painting at this size, blah, 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 right? All the things. But here's the deal. Every single time that we learn something new, we are challenged and painting is hard. And we just went through that whole list of all the things that we have to learn and all the things that we have to think about in order to make a painting. We're constantly learning. That's what painting is. We are always upping our game. We are always increasing our skill set. That is what we have, we as painters have signed up for. And so of course, if you've never done this particular thing before, if you've never painted that particular subject in that light or that many people in a setting or whatever it is that you're trying to do, if you're, if you're a representational painter and now you're trying to paint abstractly or you're an abstract painter and now you're going back to representation or maybe you're, you know, whatever it is. Like if you just think of all of those things that I just threw out at you. All of those things require an enormous amount of knowledge and skill and muscular coordination, <laughs> like all of these things, right? With each painting and with each thing, we are in some way, shape, or form learning something new. And that inherently is challenging because you've never done it before, so you don't know how to do it. So we have this challenge called painting in front of us. And it is hard. Okay, it's supposed to be hard. And that in part is why we love it so much. But then we add more onto that we add all this suffering, we have this tendency as human beings to just decide, you know what, I'm going to up the ante on this and I'm going to make a difficult thing even more difficult. 
Okay, so we're in front of our canvas. We have all these uh, decisions to make about the painting, about uh, the mark, the next mark that we're gonna make. And your brain just says, yep, yeah, I'm gonna make this harder. Let me just start judging and have an internal discussion about why I should have done it better, why I should have known better. Great, okay, now it's even harder to paint. What else can I lay on? Oh, I know, how about if I make the fact that my proportions are off mean that I'm an idiot and I can't paint and I never will be able to paint. And by the way, this is a disaster. Our brain is amazing. It creates ideas, visions, and it's very own reality while simultaneously having multiple conversations with itself. All of that happens in a split second. All of that happens sometimes without you even noticing it. This is why being aware of your thoughts and being present, being fully present while you're painting is so important. So what's happening now while you're looking at your painting and you're trying to assess the technical aspects of your painting using your critical brain, that part of your brain that analyzes and assesses, your inner critic is on a rampage. It has all the fuel. Your brain is finding all of the reasons why you're not, why you shouldn't have made that mark. What's wrong with you? The colors off, the placements off. You push too hard. You didn't push hard enough. Blah, 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 blah. It's finding all the evidence that you are not capable of making this painting. What just happened? You went into your studio thinking you were going to work on this painting and you were going to be able to finish it. And now you're having like, all this anxiety and all this stress and all of this like, ugh, right? So listen, I know painting is hard, but the suffering part of it, that's optional. You can decide to do hard things without piling on all of that suffering, without layering on all the stories. We can rise up to the challenge of painting without adding on judgment or whether or not we have the right to hold a brush all of that stuff is optional. We can make a mistake and use our critical brain to figure out what skill we need to focus on to correct the mistake and allow ourselves the possibility of learning and growing from it without making the mistake mean something that makes us suffer. You are smart enough to figure out why your painting doesn't look the way you envisioned. And just, I'm going to uh, take a second here to like go off on a little tangent. A lot of times when we're looking at our painting, we're thinking like, what's wrong with it, right? There's nothing wrong with your painting. This is something that I think kind of surprises people when they come to, to one of my critiques. I don't come into it thinking anything is wrong with your painting. The first thing I want to know is what did you want this painting to be? What did you envision? What's happening inside of your head? Because I could go in and tell you all the things that I might do to the painting, but that presupposes that I know what your intention is, that I, that presupposes that I know what the picture is that you have in your head, what you want to create, what you want to bring out onto that canvas. I have no idea what you want with that canvas. You know that answer. And so asking a lot of questions of you, of what, 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 did, you, what did you want with this painting? What feeling were you trying to get from it? What is important to you about it? What do you, what do you love about it? What do you not love about it? Those are questions I ask to understand what's happening inside of your brain. And then I take all that information and I take all this other information and we have a conversation about how to get you closer to the image that you envision. That is very, very different from coming in and saying, oh, here's what's wrong with your painting. You did this wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong. Let me just paint over it so that you can see exactly how wrong it is. There's nothing wrong with your painting. It's just not what's in your head. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is so that you can see the questions to ask yourself when you're looking, you know, when you're thinking about your own painting and how to look at it. You have so much information in your head about how to paint and the skills that you need to paint. You have like this entire Rolodex of every workshop you've ever taken, every painting you've ever looked at, every painting you've ever done. 
These all give you information and that all of that information is in your head. And I want to offer to you the idea that you have the answer, that you know what's wrong with your painting, because if you didn't know, you wouldn't see it. You would just think it was fine, which is, by the way, also, I'm going to end this this tangent in a second. That's also why you look back at paintings you did 10 years ago and you, you see things now because now you have new information and now you know when you the person who painted that painting didn't have that information so they didn't see that anything was wrong with it so all that's to say is that most of the time you can see where the gap is between your vision and what's on the canvas and even if you don't know how at that moment you can see what the issue is and then you can go about solving that issue, either by going through the Rolodex in your head or looking for external help. And I just wanted to point that distinction out to you because so often as painters, one of the stories that we tell ourselves is that we are uh, in some way helpless, that we can't solve the problem, that we don't know what we're doing, that we just don't know. And I don't know is one of those sort of indulgent thoughts that I was talking about earlier, that it just doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get you into solving the problem. Oftentimes in this context, oftentimes I don't know, leads to inaction, leads to not trying anything out because um, we just kind of throw our, head, our hands up in the air and say, oh, I just don't know. I don't know how to solve this. Okay, so let's get back to why it is that we make things so much harder than they need to be. The reason why it is so hard for you to access all the brilliance that you have in your head, and I know you're cringing, but I believe that you have that brilliance in your head. You're distracted by all the stories and all the drama that your brain creates. The story that you're not really an artist, the story that making a mistake is about who you are as a person, the story that you can't improve if you're not hard on yourself, if you're not beating yourself up, if you accept that, if you accept mistakes that you can never get better. These are stories that we have in our heads and your brain is so powerful that when you tell it something, it tries to find all the evidence for it. It's like a, the superpower computer. You give it all that information and it tries to find the evidence that it's true. So just imagine for a second, just play along with me for a minute. Imagine what would happen if you took away all those stories that you tell yourself and you just let that supercomputer focus all of its energy, all of its power on making a beautiful painting. What if that was the only thing it had to do and it wasn't trying to process all the stories that you tell it? It wasn't trying to process and find evidence for all the reasons why you're a terrible painter while it's trying to make a good painting. Like that is an incredible thing that we're ask our brain to do. It's like, you're a terrible painter. You don't know what you're doing, but let's make this amazing painting. Imagine what it would be like in your studio if your mind wasn't fact-checking the stories and trying to find all that evidence to prove that you really don't know what to do, that you really don't know how to paint. Imagine if your brain was just looking at the painting and thinking, huh, that's interesting. It's not what I envisioned. What do I need to do next? What is my next best move? And then if that was the only question it was trying to answer, then it would just use all of its processing power, all of the information to flip through that Rolodex that you have in your head, all the workshops, all the teachers, all the books, all the information that you've collected throughout your life as a painter is looking through all that saying, I have the answer. I know it's in here. Let me find it. What do I know about shape? What do I know about color? What do I know about edges? Is it the right shape in the right spot? Oh, no, let me just fix that. Now you have your next best step to take. Imagine if your brain 
was only thinking about that and not making a judgment about it and not making it mean something terrible about yourself or not making it mean something painful to yourself or not making it mean anything other than that shape is in the wrong place. Let's move that. Or that's not quite the right shape. Let me adjust that. Or the color's not working. Is it warmer, cooler, lighter, darker? Which of those is it? Let me adjust that. And now you're in the action mode. So now when you do that, when you change the shape, when you change the mark, when you change the color, now you can assess again. You reassess, you look at it again, you ask yourself those same questions. Imagine if you can do that without all the drama. <laughs> it would be such an amazing experience, right? Well, you can, you really, really can. If you didn't have the judgment and the drama and the angst, if none of that existed, how much faster would that supercomputer of yours find the answer to that question for you? If you weren't keeping score of all the marks that you made that didn't turn out right, of all the bad paintings, or of all the of the time that you've spent on this painting, or all of your paintings, if you weren't keeping score of how long you've been working, what if all of that energy was directed at your work? Doesn't that sound amazing? Does that sound just like, to me, that's just like so delicious. It's so luscious. It's so exciting. All the time, all the energy, all the focus on the painting. Sometimes we use our amazing creative imagination in ways that don't serve us. And this is one of the ways that we do that. We take something that's hard. We just add more and more onto it. We make it more and more and more difficult to the point where we just, no wonder you just don't want to do it or no wonder you get frustrated or no wonder you take a break and stop painting. What if you didn't need to do that? So the next time that you're in your studio and your brain offers you one of these stories about your capacity as a painter, about your ability to process information, about your ability to problem solve, <laughs> anything that about you as a person, about you as a painter, about whether or not the art police are going to come in and grab that paintbrush out of your hand, all of those things. When you tell yourself those stories, just come back to what's right in front of you and just ask yourself, what is my next best move? What would I do without that drama? Can I set it aside? Can I just go, hey, there it is. There's that drama. I think I'm going to move on now and figure out what is it with this painting that is not what I envisioned. That's what I have for you today. Separating the facts from the fiction in our head and finding the next best mark. Have a wonderful afternoon, and I am so happy to be back and creating things for you. I really look forward to your comments on this. Let me know how this resonated with you. And until next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Talk to you soon.